traditional welcome to Sunday or to Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, however you want to look at it. He's risen. Yes. Just yes. He's risen. Y'all forget about how to be like Galileans, don't you? Let's try it again. He's risen. All right, that's better. Listen. So last night, I thought about playing this little clip for you. You should go on, online and listen to it at about 1 o'clock in the morning. I shouldn't listen to things like this right before I need to go to bed. Dr. S.M. Lockridge is a pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego. He, uh, I think for f- like 50 years there, 40 years or 50 years there, and he is the one who made famous the saying, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, in one of his sermons. And there's a three-minute, you can listen to the whole sermon. I just listened to a three-minute clip. And he just went, and he would make a statement about hopelessness on that Friday, and where everybody's mind must have been on that Friday, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. Well, Sunday's here. Amen? And on this side of it, we know. It's fun to listen to, to stuff like I, he got me wound up and I was supposed to be going to bed. <sighs> I did not sleep well last night. I should have just stayed up, but I should have done. Anyhow, we're going to be in Luke. We're going to look at Luke chapter 24. But listen, our, our king is alive. This, this moment, this instance, this thing changed our world. It didn't just change a couple people's lives. We'll look at a few this morning, but I want to look at a couple others real quick. Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit came on the church, the church is born. Says to those that he's preaching to, as as thousands are, are coming to where that upper room was, as they're coming out of the upper room and they hear them, And they're all hearing them talk about Jesus in their own language, in their own dialect even. And when it comes down to just Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for I will not leave my soul, or for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. This is a man who had just denied Jesus three days earlier. To his face, literally. He was in the courtyard. They could make eye contact with one another. In fact, on his third denial, when he fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus said, he would. He looked up, Jesus and he locked eyes. And it says Peter ran off and wept. Now, just a little over a month later, that same man is standing in front of a crowd of thousands, preaching not only salvation, but the resurrection And the sureness that we have, the hope that we have. A man who was hopeless on one day received a a message on on the third day from women, ran to an empty tomb and didn't understand exactly what was going on. But when Mary came back, she had a message. Jesus said, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Singled him out. Later, there would be another convert, a drastic change in in this person's life, in the Apostle Paul. Uh, 
in Philippians chapter 3. He lists off all the reasons. Let me just read it. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilations, of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish as I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ and the, and the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He also writes a long chapter in 1 Corinthians. Telling us that if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus also is not resurrected from the dead. And if Jesus is not resurrected, then our faith is worthless. That we are of all people the most pathetic to believe in something that didn't really happen. Listen, there is no other religion that says their leader was raised from the dead. And some might point to the Babylonian religions and say, oh, yeah, they said, you know, whichever one, I don't remember if it was Tammuz or whoever it was, they said was raised from the dead. But it wasn't the same. That's Satan's lie, and it was confusing. It was confusing then, it's confusing now. He didn't die the way the Bible said he would die. He redeemed nobody, and he did not rise from the dead. That religion brought nothing but confusion. It was confusing from the very beginning to try to convolute the prophecies and the promise of God from the beginning, from the garden. When he said to Eve and to Satan, your seed and her seed will be at enmity with one another. You'll bruise his head, or you'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. The promise of the coming one, right from the garden, Right from the fall. And it wasn't something God just made up on the spur of the moment. We know. We've repeated this over and over again. It's one of my favorite things to remind you guys of. This plan was made from before that moment in Eden when Adam fell. It was already in place. John in Revelation again calls him the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. It was already there, already in place. You guys can amen as loud as you want to today. I, I'm telling you, I watched that, I listened to that clip last night, I'm fired up. Thank you. In Luke 24, we'll start with verse 1. We're not going to go through the whole thing because it's 50 some verses long. Luke 24, verse 1. This is now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And we know from the other gospel accounts of the, of the crucifixion that the women that came with them from Galilee and a few others were standing afar off watching what was happening. They followed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea as they laid him in the tomb so they would know where to go. 
And as you read the different accounts, it's probably at least six women that went. And they realized on their way there, um, how are we going to get the stone out of the way? You know, you don't have the sons of thunder with you. You don't have the burly fisherman Peter there. You don't have big guys to even try to attempt to roll that stone away. Not to mention a guard that was set. What kind of permission would they, should they have gotten to even break the seal on that stone? Because it was sealed. And yet they went anyways. They went not expecting to find their Savior alive, but went expecting to still find him dead and to finish the job of embalming his body. They didn't go expecting to see an open tomb. They didn't go expecting to see an empty tomb. They didn't go expecting to be able to talk to him, to see him ever again. They all, even these women, had in mind that their Messiah was going to set up his kingdom and overthrow Rome and take on the rule of the world. All promised in the Old Testament. But they had still, even though he had explained over and over again, even come right out and said, I am going to die, but on the third day I'll come back. And somehow that missed their ears. We know he said it plainly. We know he said it clearly because his enemies said to Pilate, he has said he'll be back on the third day, that he's going to be raised from the dead. We need a, we need a guard and we need a seal to make sure that his disciples don't come and steal the body. His enemies knew clearly what he said. Even his closest followers didn't understand. They had embraced the hopelessness of another promised Messiah dying. Many had come along and, and been and said, I'm the, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah. They had looked to others. They even went out and asked John the Baptist, Are you the one? He said, I'm not the one. The one is coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to untie. I'm just the one in the wilderness preparing the way, making the way for the Lord. For that one. These ladies did not go out expecting to find what they found. But in verse 2 it says, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The two things they did not expect. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. You hear people say, How can somebody keep preaching on this? How how, how is it? In fact, I know pastors who won't change what they're preaching on Easter or on Christmas. They're going to stay with their, with their guys who teach verse by verse. They're just going to stay right with it. If this is what God wanted me to preach, he would have had me in that section on those days. Listen, people don't remember. His closest didn't remember his words. It took two angels just appearing at the moment. Can you imagine? It says they were perplexed. They're probably wondering, are we at the right spot? There's no soldiers here. I thought this was the right place, but the tomb is open. And there's nobody inside. There's no dead body. Have you, listen, have you ever been deer hunting? You guys who hunt and been out in the woods in a place that you know and you get turned around? And you're like, I don't know where I'm at. 
in a place where I hunted for, for years with, with my dad and, and other family members. I got out. I wasn't even that far from the, from the camp. But I got out and I got turned around. And, and it got dark. And it got really dark. And as I tried to walk, all of a sudden, I could see the mercury light that was on the pole at camp. And it took that light, I don't know, half a mile away. It took that light for me to navigate my way through the trees, through the swamp, to, a road, to get back to camp. These ladies are, are they don't know what to do. But then it says, these two guys showed up with shining garments. And the, the Greek word for shining there is like lightning. There was no mistaking who these guys were or what they were. I mean, they didn't obviously know them by name. But this is not normal for people to show up with these kind of clothes on. And it says they bowed down. They got on their face. They were afraid. And the question that is to all of us, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are so many looking for life in dead places, in dead ideologies, in institutions of government and whatever else that promise nothing but death? And they're looking for life and they're looking for identity and they don't know. And the question is, why? Why are you looking there for life? Life isn't in that. Confusion and chaos are in that. Death is in that. Just remaining in a broken state. Have you listened to any of the testimonies of people who are detrans? however you say it now, and how broken they are, how some who were changed by their parents when they were young. This has been going on long enough already that some of these people are growing up into late teens, early 20s, and saying, you wrecked my life. You didn't let me grow up. You didn't help me. The warning was there when all of this was a big push Five, ten, however many years ago it's been now. Hospitals that had been doing the, the surgeries in the, in the 70s were no longer doing the surgeries because they found out it didn't help the person psychologically. Right? It didn't help what was going on in their head and in their heart. It didn't fix anything. Because it's all a lie. You're encouraging people to live in a lie. There, there's nothing but confusion and more brokenness there. And there's nothing but confusion and more brokenness in, in anything. If you live a life that is dependent on some other substance rather than the breath that God gave you. Rather than giving your pain to him, you're just going to bury it. You're just going to numb it. When you come out of it, you're, there's still pain. It's still there. And there's no promise of it ever getting better. The only promise is it's going to lead to death. It's just going to make it faster. If you can stand in front of people and say, I don't believe in anything. I'm an atheist. You're lying. You can't even do that anymore. You can't even say, well, I followed the science. It all blew up, and here we are. You can't. When secular scientists are saying, that can't possibly have happened, there has to have been a beginning. There has to have been a cause to the universe. Those are secular scientists. They don't want them to be God. In fact, they're mad that the Christians are saying, hey, hey we know what the cause was. We know. They're like, no, no, it can't be your God. But there was a cause. 
See, if I can, if I can say the term, I mean, the theory correctly, the Kalam cosmological, <laughs> Kalam cosmological theory. In other words, it just means that the universe had a beginning, had a cause. It didn't just happen. It's impossible for it to have just happened. They even know that. They're not changing the textbooks for that. They're chucking textbooks out so they can change history. They're chucking textbooks out so they can change the psychology they teach the kids in the class, which was already damaging enough. They don't need to replace those books. They need to get rid of them, but they don't need to replace them. The ideology now is no longer you broke me, it's your fault that I am who I am. Now it's just, I am who I am. And I am who I want to be. Doesn't matter if it's a lie or not. And you can't tell me it's a lie. Because if you tell me it's a lie, you're going to jail. We, we have, I'm hearing stories, multiple stories now of people who have to sign affirming statements to keep their job. I, not, not I'll tolerate it. Not I'll be nice to them. I will affirm their ideology. I will say that that's true. I will fall in line with that. And the reality of it is, even still, the statistics of, of what you know, part of our population is even claiming to be a part of the LGBTQ community is only like 5%. Why are we all afraid? Why are we falling in line? How come we can't stand up and say, but you're living a lie? And you want me to live a lie. You want me to sign a paper saying that I'll believe this and I'll go along with it and I'll even say it's good. You can't. We're going we're gonna to face it. It's coming. Other countries are mocking us because of this. But we're redefining what freedom is. And freedom now is taking the chains and putting them on your wrist yourself. Freedom is going to be something completely different to everybody else. Here's the thing. And this has never been any different. It's never been any different. The only freedom that we actually have is in Christ Jesus. That's the only freedom we have. To be set free from our sin. To be set free from death. On the cross on Friday, he conquered sin. He paid for sin. On Sunday morning when he came out of the grave, he defeated death. We just read, the Bible says, it was impossible for death to keep a hold of him. Yeah. He was only in that tomb for as long as he was because that's as long as he said he would be there. But his closest had forgotten what he said until they were reminded. This day is to be a remembrance for us. You know, all kinds of theological arguments about, should we do it on this day? Should we not do it on this day? Should we do it, you know, should we celebrate the birth of Christ on 25th of December and all the arguments? Listen, those days the church has set in time past to be remembrance of the coming of our Lord and the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord so that we have hope that nobody else has. We can be in chains like Paul when he wrote Philippians that men have put on us and still have hope. They can tell us we're going to take your life. We're going to take everything you have. They're already saying it to everybody, aren't they? You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. They can take it all. But we still have hope. 
They can make everybody else feel hopeless. We're destroying the planet. We have islands of plastic floating around in the planet. And it's all America's fault. We're not even close to the top of the, of the heap on that. Not even close. I just saw a thing about it two days ago. The Philippines, actually, of all countries in the world, the Philippines are the most, the greatest polluters of our oceans. But we're taking the hit for it. Don't matter. Doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter. Clean up the floating debris. I mean, they're talking about these islands, and you can actually get out and walk on these islands of pollution or whatever. Then go clean them up. We've got ships that can do that. Like a lawnmower. Run right through that stuff, pick it up, and take care of it. But we don't want to do that. We're just going to say you can't have plastic straws anymore. Does that make sense? Listen, they can take it all. They can take everything that we say is freedom, all of our rights. They can take our guns. They can take our books. And listen, don't think they're not coming for this too. They're finding all kind of ways to get into your house, Christian. Why do you think they're coming? They know you're not going to fight back if they show up with a SWAT team. They're going to take everything. But we still have hope. We still have hope. Our hope can't be in our country. It can't be in our flag. It can't be in our pledge. It can't be on our money. Just because we say, in God we trust here, and we print it out, or there, or whatever. Most of the people that handle that stuff, if you handle money at all anymore, don't believe that. They're all panicking because our dollar is crashing. Our economy is crashing. We just had a, a run on small banks a couple weeks ago. Things that haven't happened since the Depression. But how many true believers of Jesus? And listen, it was a little scary. You wonder what's going to happen, what you're going to wake up to the next day. But did you lose hope? What's the worst that they can do to us? Send us home? Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is nothing new. Story after story after story of great saints that have gone before us. Preachers and parents and whatever, whatever they were arrested for. Who stood, some at the stake being burned alive. Some being thrown off of things, some being hung, whatever, whatever the shot, whatever was going on. And their last words, glorify God. Their example for us, every one of these people, every one of the 12, except for John, is going to die a horrible, horrible death. Because they insist that they saw Jesus alive. That he came back from the dead. That he's the only way for salvation. Listen, there is no other religion that promises what the Bible promises. None. You want to be a Buddhist? You're just going to you know, go into nothingness. That's your big achievement. You just are done. Baha'i, everybody's kind of good, and you know, you sort it all out at the end. Taoism, they all have the secret, but they can't tell anybody. You got to discover it all on your own. We're the only ones that say that our leader was God, is God, still God, and is alive. We're the only ones. And we're the ones that keep coming after. And, and the one tied closest to us, Judaism, they come after them. Because they want to keep them blind. That's the motivation of the enemy. They may not know that and understand that, but that's the motivation the enemy uses in their heart to keep them down. Why? 
It's a little bitty country. We've got states. Many of our states are bigger than that country. Why do they care? Because God keeps blessing them, even though they've not recognized their Messiah. His hand is still there. And it makes everybody else in the world jealous. And you can even hear some of the reports from Palestinians complaining because Israel's God is redirecting their missile. What? Then why don't you believe? Why would you stay with a God who can't defeat their God? Why wouldn't you just climb the fence and go? But even them, they want to separate themselves from Jesus so far, but they, they, want, us to, they want to be able to put people in jail. You share Jesus in Israel, that's, that's the hope. It's probably not going to happen, at least not now. But that's, they put this bill forward in their, in their government. Two ultra-Orthodox Jews have said, if you share Jesus openly, on the street or on the Internet, you share Jesus as, as Messiah, one year in jail. If you share with somebody below the age of 18, two years in jail. That's what they want. That's not, though, as diabolical as what they want to do here. But we still have hope. No matter what, we still have hope. Seeing the baby here right now, just looking up. This morning I was listening to some worship music. And David Crowder and some others redid Bill Gaither's song, um, Because He Lives. And there's a line in that song, and, and, and it was during 2020, so he did it with another couple. Uh, I think their group's name is actually Johnny Swim, and I can't remember the other young lady who was part of it as well. But the couple had their baby with them, brand new baby, that had just been born while they're singing, while they're recording their part. And they let the baby, the baby cry it out and they left it in the song. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. And I can't remember the whole verse, but it, it, the end of that verse is something like, <clears throat> this child can face uncertain days because he lives. I don't like what our kids are going to face, but they can face it because he lives. Because Jesus lives. can't say that baby doesn't have a chance that baby's got all the chances in heaven not in this world but in heaven right we don't put our faith in the flesh our faith is in Jesus Christ in him alone and we've gained a righteousness not on our own merit but a righteousness that is given to us by God Paul said there in Philippians And one day we'll see him and Job says, I know, I know that in my flesh I will see my God, that he will stand on the earth. And even though my flesh will be destroyed in my flesh, I'll see him. Even Job, the oldest story in the Bible we have, Job knew he needed a redeemer, he had a redeemer, and he was going to be resurrected to see him. Job knew that. There's nothing new as far as God is concerned. His message has always been the same. And to know him, you take the basis of his message that he preached when he would say, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How many times in the book of Matthew do you hear that being his message? And even when he sent out the, the disciples two at a time, what did he tell them to say? 
You tell the people, repent, for the kingdom of God is near you. If it was coming out of Jesus' mouth, the kingdom of God is standing right in front of you. If it was his disciples, if it's us, the kingdom of God is near. Why? Because we have him present with us always. They're not to look to us. They're to look to him. So we can say the kingdom of God is near, but it's because he's with me. You can know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can, you can have hope again. You can have joy again. Go through the book of Acts. See what they went through. The persecution that caused believers to move out from one city, but then take root in another one and face the persecution there. Even after they had appointed the deacons, all of a sudden you got persecution, the deacons are gone. And Philip, the deacon. Not Philip the apostle. It has two daughters who were prophesied. Goes out and witnesses to an Ethiopian eunuch from Isaiah. Right? We're not supposed to use the Old Testament anymore, right? From Isaiah. And taught him everything he needed to know to the point where that eunuch said, Is there there's a little bit of water right here? Is there anything keeping me from being baptized right now? And what happened after Philip said, no, man, let's go, man, put the brakes on, let's do it. And it was that Philip was taken and found in another place. All kinds of things that they endured, the persecution they endured. We saw again in Philippians, Paul, if he, to be a Jew of Jews, he persecuted the church. He would say in another place, it was like fire. If I, had a, if I had the opportunity, I threw my vote against them. If I had my opportunity, I voted for them to die. I think that's why in another place he calls himself the least of all the apostles. He knew what he was. And yet he had joy. And yet he had peace. He was sitting in jail with Silas for preaching the gospel, and they would begin to worship, and the whole place would shake. Evidently, the Lord decided to join in with whatever they were saying. Right? Shook the whole place. Chains fell off. Doors flew open. Freedom. Except for that they didn't go anywhere. At their freedom, that jailer thought he was going to die. He lost hope in even living for another day. But what happened? Paul cries out when he takes that, that, that sword and he's ready to kill himself. Paul says, no, no, don't. We're all still here. And by the end of the night, his whole house is given over to the Lord and given over to the gospel. Back in Luke in verse 9, it says, Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Look at that. It's not even just the eleven that are there. Judas is gone. Judas has gone out and hung himself. But there's more there than just the eleven. And it was Mary Magdalene in verse 10. Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed like they seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. They didn't believe them. The ones who sat closer to the Lord for three and a half years walked with him everywhere they went, talked with him, had gone out preaching the gospel, healing the sick, 
casting out demons. Remember when they came back, Lord, even the demons were subject to us. Well, what was his reminder? Don't rejoice in that the demons were subject to you. You rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Salvation is way more important than signs and wonders. Way more important. If we just preach a gospel of healing and deliverance, deliverance from what? We don't want to say that. We don't want to say the S word. It's like the three-letter word is worse than the four-letter words. It's sin. Across the board, everybody has to be delivered from that. Verse 12 says, But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. I think it's John that says that Peter didn't just look in, he ran in. John got there ahead of him. Remember, the two of them ran to the tomb. And John points out that, you know, yeah, I beat the younger, I beat the old guy. I beat him there, I passed him up, left him in the dirt. But when he got there, John's peeking down in, and Peter, I don't know, maybe he hesitated for a moment, but then he was inside. Why not? I mean, you didn't want to touch a grave, and I'm sure that's why John stopped outside, because it defiled you from being able to worship in the temple, and you're still, you still have uh, feast days going on. But Peter, in his heart and his mind, I've already defiled myself. I have denied him to his face. And, and went in. And then John went in. It says he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. It says, now behold, two of them. This is not even any of the eleven. Two of them. Were traveling the same, that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they were conversing and reasoned, or while they while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know Him. And He said to them. What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and, and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happen there in these days? And he said to them, What things? Can you imagine? Listen, how many times do you have conversations by yourself in the car? Out loud. You ever stop and think that maybe that's God just drawing it out of you? Instead of letting you keep it all bottled up, whatever you're complaining about, whatever you're going on about, he's just, tell me about it. What are you talking about? Like he doesn't know. Tell me your side of it. So they said to him, the, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping, uh, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to be, was going to redeem Israel. Uh, their hope was in the wrong place. They had tried to put on Jesus that he was going to set up his kingdom then. Just like the women, they didn't remember, they didn't believe. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since, the, since these things happened. All right, and I'm telling you, these two guys walked with him all the time. They're there with these 11. They're hanging out. They're, they're part of the big group. I'm convinced these two are probably in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, especially after this. In fact, I bet you <laughs> I'm, the disciples probably couldn't shake these two. 
the rest of the time, just in case Jesus showed up again. On the third day, or this is the third day, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived uh, at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who, who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. I'm probably going to say this a lot, but are we supposed to get rid of the Old Testament? Do we be cutting our Bible in half and only New Testament? We're a New Testament church, so that's where we stay. Slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ had to have suffered these things and entered, or to enter into his glory? And be, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let me tell you about your Messiah. Let me tell you. Let me remind you of all the things he said, but they don't remember. Listen, when we lose hope, if we lose hope, if we get so focused on our circumstances that we begin to lose hope and we set aside our joy, we're going to forget the things that God has said to us. We're going to forget the things that are written. And you're not going to even want to pick up your Bible because you know the answers are there, but I don't want the answer. I'm afraid of the answer maybe that God's going to give me. There's people that don't want to do that. But listen, get your Bible. Remember who he is. Remember your Lord, your Savior. Remember your God. Dig at the wisdom that he's put here for you to be able to live your life in glory and honor for him. Don't ever walk away from this, not from any part of it. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Listen, if you're in, his, if you're in the Bible, if you're in his word, if you're studying this, if you want to know what he has to say, he's going to stay with you. He doesn't just say, here it is, now figure it out. You might hear a little bit of, listen, my little foolish one, <laughs> my, my slow of heart to believe, let me remind you of all that you've already heard, of all that the prophets have said. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed him, broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. All right. I, know, I know this is probably a little disturbing to these people who had to experience this in and out and in and out and in and out for, you know, 40 days. But I think Jesus had fun with this. The scriptures didn't completely open your eyes, but he's got them, right? He's reeling them in. He's got their heart. In fact, they even said in the next verse, they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Didn't we feel it? Didn't we know in our hearts? But something in the way he took the bread and he broke it and he handed it to him. Maybe until that point, the sleeves covered the holes in his wrist so that when he stretched out, they saw. Or maybe, just maybe, because it said their eyes were constrained. They, didn't, they weren't allowed to see who he was at first. And that their eyes were open now. 
by God, by the Father. Look who's sitting in front of you. We don't always see Jesus in what we're doing. We don't always see him in, in where we're going, in what's going on. He's right there with us all the time. You, maybe you're studying or you're reading or you're listening to somebody like I was last night, three minute little, it's Sunday, but, or it's Friday, but Sunday's are coming. I would have loved to have heard him preach that sermon. But you'll feel it burning inside of you. Why? Because you already know the truth. If you've been a believer for any amount of time, whatever study you've done, you know the truth. To whatever degree you follow Jesus, you know the truth. And he will, if you'll stay in his word, he will open up the scriptures to you and he'll take you even deeper into it. And he'll give you the ability to understand. He's promised. John and 1 John says we... We have the anointing so that we understand. We don't have to have another teacher. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us, to give us understanding. So whether you're stranded on a desert island somewhere with your Bible and that's all you got, or whether you're sitting in a, in a building full of thousands of people, you got your Bible and it's right there. He will be the one to give you understanding. And you'll know. You'll know the truth. And you'll know if you're hearing the truth. And you should know if you're hearing a lie and run. Don't walk. Don't skip. Get on the track shoes and get out of there. So they get up, they go back to where everybody else is at. From here, Jesus is going to appear to the disciples. We're not going to go through the whole chapter. You go home and go through the whole chapter. Listen, and this was, this not recognizing Jesus right away was happening to everybody who saw him for the first time, except for the 12, I think, or the 11, when you see him appear to them. Actually, it's not even the 11. Thomas is missing the first time. And he, he, his response, I, I won't believe, I don't care if the other ten of you saw, ten eyewitnesses. I don't care if the women saw him. I don't care if Mary Magdalene touched him. I don't care if he appeared to Peter personally. I can't believe unless I can see him and stick my hand in his side and put my finger in, in his nail prints. I, I can't. And maybe, believer, you're there. I don't see God. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know if I believe anymore. He's not going to leave you alone. And he's not going to pick on you. And he's not going to dog you. He's going to show up and he's going to say, remember what I did. There's a nail prints in my hands, in my wrist, in my feet. The marks on my face where the crown of thorns were. Isaiah said they would beat him so badly he wouldn't even be recognizable as a man anymore. And he's going to say, I haven't forgotten you. He would show up for Thomas. Eight days later, I believe it is, what's eight? What does that represent in the Bible? A new beginning. That was Thomas's new beginning. He falls on his face, my God and my King. And then Jesus says, you get up here and you touch this. I heard you. Touch my hand. Touch my side. It's here. Paul called it entering into his suffering. To share in the suffering of, of Jesus. And before we blame Thomas too much, one of the other gospel accounts said oh, they all had to do it. It wasn't just Thomas. But then Jesus pronounces a, a special blessing on you and me. Because he says, 
Thomas, you believe because you, you see. Blessed are those who are going to believe even though they haven't seen. Even though they haven't seen, even though they haven't heard my voice, they're going to have my words because of you. If you read John, Jesus prays for us before he goes to the cross. He says, not only do I pray for these, but those who are going to believe because of their words. He had already committed us to the Father. In some days, it's going to be hard to believe. But Jesus can handle that. Some days he's going to have to draw the confession out of us. He's all right with that. I mean, you don't want to make it a regular practice, but he's not afraid to come and meet you. He's not going to make you crawl so far in torment and torture before you finally cry out to the Lord. It's not that. It's his gentleness. It's his kindness. It's going in to share a meal with these two and stretching out his hands. It's meeting Mary at the tomb. And she's so blind, can't see him, probably partly because she's been crying so much and weeping. She thinks he's the gardener. What are you looking for? Why, what are you doing, daughter? Did you take him? Tell me where you put him. I'll go and I'll, I'll take his body all by herself. And what does he say? Just her name, Mary. And she didn't want to let go. She grabbed a hold of him and said, Mary, I still, I still, I know, I know, but I still have to go to my father. You're not going to be able to hold me here. But it was just the way he said her name. Some days, you guys, we have to go back to the way we heard our name called the first time. Whether you were an adult or whether you were eight years old like me or, or another kid, a younger kid, older kid, whatever it was, a teenager in the middle of something that you shouldn't have been or whatever it is. Go back to the time when you first knew, when you first heard his, him call you. Sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes it's remembering the birth of your children and how amazing the whole thing was. Don't forget. And these are the last words I'm going to close with. As he appeared to the disciples in a locked room, says he appeared in the midst of them, his first words, my last words today, peace to you. Peace to you. Peace to me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the examples that you've set of other believers that you put in front of us that we could know that we're not alone in our thoughts and our feelings and our fears and our doubts. But also to know that we are united across the generations in our hope with the same desire to see your face. Maybe even jealous that they're already there with you. But knowing that one day, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him to meet you in the air. What a great and awesome and wonderful and glorious day that's going to be. And as much sometimes that I wish I could have been a fly on the wall with all of these people as they were, you revealed yourself to them, I want that day more. For you to reveal yourself to me. So that in the words of Job, even if my flesh is destroyed, I know that in my flesh I'm going to see you with my eyes. And there will be no doubt 
There's no fear. I will know who you are. Because your word has already revealed you to me and to all those who believe. Lord, thank you for the promise of a new life. In Jesus' name, amen.